Hi guys, uh, welcome to the lecture about uh, congenital heart malformations. Uh, today we should uh, talk about the morphology of the heart diseases. Uh, this is pathological lecture, so I will focus mainly at the morphology of the diseases and I don't want to bother you with the details about the treatment or about the clinical diagnostics. Uh, sometimes we will touch the clinical consequences, but uh, the majority of the lecture will be focused at the morphology. It's, it's partially it's because uh, this topic, the morphology of the heart diseases, is a little bit pushed aside. You will slightly touch it in anatomy, slightly touch it in embryology, you will touch it in pathology. But uh, in all preclinical subjects of medicine, it's a little bit pushed aside. But then you will reach the clinical medicine, you will come to the pediatric ward, for example, and you are expected to know it. So I will try to fill the gap a little bit for you. What heart malform malformation is? It's some sort of um, congenital malformation of the heart set in the period of the heart embryogenesis which is between the third and eighth week of gestation and it's by far the most common heart disease of childhood. And the etiology is mostly unknown. In a, in a, in a vast majority of the cases we don't know what caused the heart malformation. But sometimes it can come as a part of genetic syndromes such as Down syndrome, DeGeorge and many others. Uh, you should keep in mind that uh, many congenital genetic syndromes carry increased risk of heart malformations because you know those syndromes especially according to according the external appearance of those patients you know that the patients with uh, down syndrome have a typical typical appearance of the face for example but those changes are rather uh, rather cosmetic and the, the most severe thing happen happens inside so the patients with genetic syndromes, such as Down syndrome, for example, they are in increased risk of uh, various malformations, included congenital heart diseases. Patients with Down syndrome typically have uh, AV septal defect. Uh, patients with DeGeorge, they often they often uh, they often develop uh, common arterial trunk or tetralogy of fallout, for example. And sometimes the heart diseases can be caused by some external environmental factors. Maybe you know TORCH as a shortcut, as an acronym of the most common uh, intrauterine infections. Drugs, uh, and I mean not only the drugs uh, meaning, uh, uh, meaning uh, IV drugs, for example, or people who are addicti addicted to our drugs, but drugs, I mean also medicaments or gestational diabetes. It, it's good to know that also uh, diabetic mothers are in increased risk of heart diseases. But usually we don't know what caused the heart malformation. Usually the etiology is unknown. This is the prevalence of the heart malformations for 1000 of live-born children. These are the data from our Republic, from the Czech Republic. And they are a little bit old, but um, the prevalence is uh, still the same, I would say. As you can see, the by far the most common uh, heart malformation is VSD, ventricular septal defect. Uh, the real number is maybe even higher because VSD has a tendency of spontaneous closure, uh, even, uh, often in utero. So the real number may be even higher. Uh, to create uh, such a classification or, or to create such a list may be challenging because um, in a lot of cases the heart malformations are grouped together. In a clinical practice you will face uh, a lot of patients with uh, mixed with multiple heart malformations and in these situations it's quite difficult to tell uh, which disease is the most severe and how we should classify this patient and how we should classify this malformation. Should we classify it as a complex one or should we classify it according to the most severe part of the complex, complex malformation? We are not sure. But VSD is by far the most common one. Also, it's good to know that the VSD is not always the bad thing. 
because especially especially in those complex malformations the VSD is actually can be actually a good thing and sometimes uh, it can be even a, a life-saving uh, change because uh, sometimes the VSD is the only chance for the blood to shunt from one side of the heart to another typical typical example is a uh, common uh, is transposition of the great arteries because in transposition of the great arteries the aorta goes from right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk goes from the left ventricle and in this situation the patient has uh, two independent blood circuits which is lethal this condition is lethal unless there is some sort of communication that allows shunting of the blood from one side to another which is usually VSD so as you can see in some situations the ventricular septal defect can be even life-saving uh, change life-saving condition and we've got some basic classification of the heart malformations uh, don't worry uh, I explain all those short all those uh, all those uh, all those uh, letters uh, in the next minutes but uh, basically we can classify the heart diseases uh, as uh, diseases with shunt and without shunt shunt means that the part of the blood misses the part of the circulation if you have a right to left shunt it means that the deoxygenated blood from the right heart misses lungs and goes direct, directly to the left heart and to the systemic circulation as a venous alloy and uh, these diseases behave like cyanotic diseases typical example is tetralogy of fallout or double outlet right ventricle or TGA it's a transposition of the great arteries left to right shunt is the opposite it means that the oxygenated blood that came from the lungs go shunts from the left heart back to the right heart and back to the pulmonary circulation so there is no need so there is no reason for for cyanosis but there is an overload of the pulmonary circulation because there is a huge amount of blood going back to the to the pulmonary circulation and those are usually holes in the heart asd vsd which means atrial and ventricular septal defect avsd is atrioventricular septal defect we will discuss them in a minute PDA is patent arterial duct and all those holes in the heart usually serve as a left to right chant because there is usually a higher pressure in the left heart compared to the right side in some situation the malformation doesn't have any shunt but there is some obstruction there is some obstruction that blocks the flow of the blood those can be various stenosis and atresias of the valves or COA, it's correctation, it's correctation of the aorta. And then we've got the others, which can be uh, anomalous return of the pulmonary veins, for example, or some malformations of the coronary arteries. But please keep in mind that this classification is very, very basic, because uh, in reality, uh, you will face the patients with so complex uh, heart malformations that the circulation is so changed that it's difficult to, to tell whether, whether there is a left to right or right to left shunt. Also, you will see a combination of many malformations. Also, some malformations which are more complex can be classified according to more than one classifications. Typical example is tetralogy of fallout. In tetralogy of fallout, there is a VSD, ventricular septal defect. So it can be classified as a disease with a shunt. But also there is a pulmonary stenosis. So it can be classified as an obstructive disease. So as, as you can see, this classification is very, very basic and the reality is much more complex. So keep it in mind, please. And how the patients, how the children with shunts will look like if you have a child with the right left chant, it means that the part of the deoxygenated blood from the right heart misses the lungs and goes di directly to the left heart and to the systemic circulation. So there is a venous alloy. There is a part of deoxygenated blood that goes to the systemic circulation. And the result is a chronic hypoxia. 
those children will be cyanotic and the cyan cyanosis will be central not the, not the peripheral so those children won't have won't have just the cyanosis on of the acral part of the body or the lips but there will be also a cyanosis of the mucosas the tongue for example children will be dyspneic and they will be there will be failure to thrive it's good to keep in mind uh, uh, it's a uh, general uh, for all the chronic diseases in childhood if the child suffers for for uh, any chronic disease it can negatively affect its growth so uh, the failure of thrive it's a risky consequence of basically any more severe chronic disease not just the uh, congenital heart disease the patients can have finger clubbing maybe you know it it's a it's a typical consequence of chronic hypoxia generally so also the patients with uh, uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis for example often developed finger clubbing but uh, each tissue in our body will suffer from hypoxia each organ will be hypoxic and if the hypoxia will be severe enough it can uh, it can cause a multiple dysfunction of the multiple organs and last but not least, our blood will react to the chronic hypoxia uh, by increased number of the red blood cells, which we call polycythemia. The child with the left to right chant will look differently. In case of left to right chant, the oxygenated blood from the left heart goes back to the right heart and back to the pulmonary circulation. So there is no reason for cyanosis, but the cir pulmonary circulation will be overloaded by the new blood. The child will be dyspneic as well, because the lung will be full of blood, it will be heavy, and the chi child, will, child will have a problems with breathing. And it will result in lung hypertension. So there will be increased blood pressure in the pulmonary circulation this hypertension will be uh, functional only at the beginning at the beginning there will be just a functional hypertension but in the course of the time this uh, hypertension will become fixed because if the lung suffers for hypertension for a longer period of, of time uh, the lung the lung vessels will react to that so there will be remodeling of the pulmonary circulation and the functional lung hypertension will transform into fixed lung hypertension, which is quite problematic because in the face of fixed lung hypertension, even if you cure the heart disease, the lung hypertension won't normalize. And the terminal state, which you, you won't see too much in these days, uh, it's quite it's quite rare in these days especially in the western world but uh, the terminal state of such lung hypertension is the situation in which the lung hypertension will be so severe that it, it will be higher than a systemic blood pressure and the left to right chant will change into right to left chant and the non-cyanotic disease will become cyanotic this switch from left to right chant to right to left chant is called Eisenmenger syndrome and it's a terminal phase of those diseases and it's quite severe condition but as i said especially in the western world it's not so common nowadays okay so this was the introduction and now let's talk about uh, the specific uh, malformations themselves and we'll begin we'll be uh, begin with the uh, more more simple ones and we will slowly move towards the more complex diseases and we will start with the holes in the heart asd atrial septal defect what it is asd is some sort of communication between left and right atrium so usually it behaves like a left to right chant because there is a normally there is a high pressure in the left atrium compared to the right right atrium and the right heart. We've got several subtypes of ASD. The less severe, least severe is so-called 
for Ramen Ovale patents. What does it mean? As you, as, as you probably know, in the fetal stage of the development, there is a hole between left and right atrium. It's called foramen ovale. And because in the fetal, fetal phase of the life, uh, the blood goes from the right heart directly to the left heart via foramen ovale. And there is also a membrane that covers foramen ovale. There is a valve. After the birth, after the delivery, the valve closes foramen ovale and it fuses with the rim of the foramen ovale and it closes it. And the remnant is called fossa ovalis. If this fails, we call it foramen ovale patents. So in foramen ovale patents, the membrane, the valve is present, but it is not fused with the foramen ovale. So, as you would probably guess, this sort of malformation uh, will remain clinically silent because there is a, normally there is a high pressure in the left atrium compared to the right atrium and this high pressure will keep the membrane attached to the foramen ovale. But this, this disease, this channel, this defect can manifest itself in case of increased pulmonary pressure. So if the patient has some primary pulmonary disease, some pulmonary fibrosis or some cancer, uh, or the patients with pulmonary embolism, in those situations uh, there is a increased pressure in the lungs, which means there is also increased pressure in the right atrium, and this increased pressure will open this, this defect and it can become manifest. Also, those patients are in, in increased risk of paradoxical embolism. So this is for amen ovale patents. Usually it remains clinically silent. Oval fossa defect is something else. Oval fossa defect means that the membrane is missing or it's uh, incomplete. There can be fenestration, for example. In case of oval, uh, fossa ovale is the defect, oval fossa defect, uh, these patients have real hole, tr they have true hole between left and right atrium, which serves as a left to right shunt. But still, even in this subtype, the malformation usually remains silent. But it can be, it can be, it can be clinically apparent if the hole is big enough. So this is the difference between foramen ovale patents and oval fossa defect. Foramen ovale patents means that the membrane is created but it's just not fused with the foramen ovale and the fossa ovalis defect or the oval fossa defect. It means that the membrane is missing and there is a true hole between atriums. Uh, according to some authors, the foramen ovale patents is not the disease, it's not a malformation, and they consider, consider it rather a uh, rather, uh, variation. And then we have some uh, less, uh, less common defects, uh, such as sinus venosus defect and coronary sinus defect. Sinus venosus defect means that there is a communication between uh, vena cava, cava vein, and the left atrium. Usually, in the vast majority of the cases, it's the superior cable vein. Very rarely is the inferior one. So there is a hole, usually it's a hole between the wall of the wall of the, of the uh, superior cable vein and the left atrium. The defect is usually localized here very close to the opening of the cable vein to the right atrium. Uh, coronary sinus defect is the same for the coronary sinus. So again, it's the communication between the wall of the coronary sinus and the left atrium. The last type is something we called ostium primum, ASD. It's a defect situated here in the bottom, bottom part of the interatrial septum, which is the region of uh, embryonal ostium primum. We used to consider it as a subtype of ASD. Nowadays, it's excluded. Nowadays, this ostium primum defect is considered uh, to be AVSD. And I will explain why in a several minutes. Uh, 
uh, you will probably probably wonder uh, how the sinus venous defect really looks like because normally if you would make a hole in this region if you would make a hole in the wall of the cable vein you would leave the heart how is it possible that uh, you can enter the left atrium how is it possible the sinus venous defect in fact is much more complex malformation than it seem that than it seems uh, at the first glance and it looks like this because the two things happen here the first thing is that the superior cable vein which is this is moved a little bit to the left and it becomes let's say overriding it becomes overriding and it sits above the interatrial septum so this is the first thing this shift man this movement of the superior cable vein to the left and the second thing is there is an anomalous return of the pulmonary vein which opens not in into the left atrium but it opens into the wall of the superior cable vein so and those two things this movement of the superior cable vein to the left and this anomalous return of the pulmonary vein to the wall of the superior cable vein those two things create something like conduit or something like bridge that bypasses the interatrial septum and that's why it is possible to enter the superior cable vein and exit via left atrium so as you can see the sinus venosus defect is in reality much more complex malformation than just the hole uh, the sinus venous defect affecting the inferior cable vein it's the same it's the same malformation but just for the inferior cable vein okay and now let's talk about the vsd ventricular septal defect VSD is the communication between the left and right ventricle. We've got several subtypes here. We've got perimembranous, which is the most common, muscular, which is less common, and juxta arterial, which is the least common, is the rarest form. Uh, perimembranous VSD is situated in the membranous part of the interventricular septum, in pars membranacea. You will recognize it because the the roof of the perimembranous VSD is muscular, but the floor is fibrous, and this fibrous floor it's the remnant of the uh, membranous septum. Muscular VSD is situated in the muscular part of the septum, and therefore uh, all the borders of the defect are muscular. Juxta arterial defect has, in contrast to the perimembranous, juxta arterial defect has a muscular floor but a fibrous roof and this fibrous roof is continuous with the aortic and pulmonary valve. That's how, you that's how you recognize it. Those defects can be solitary or they can be multiple. Uh, they often, as I mentioned before, they often can come as a part of more complex malformations. So in a lot of cases, in a lot of situations, you won't have a patient with isolated VSD, but the VSD will be just a part of more complex malformation. And as I mentioned before, sometimes it's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes it's even, it's even a life-saving thing. Uh, okay. So here's the picture of one of my hearts. So this is the opened right ventricle. This is the inlet and outlet portion. This is the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary valve. And here, this is the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And here's the defect. This is perimembranous defect. And it's, it's usually hidden below the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. So it's, it's, good, to, it's good to probe it, it's good to actively look be below the leaflet because there can be tiny VSD hidden beneath the, beneath the leaflet uh, sorry 
and let's look at some big uh, videos I, j I just hope it will work oh, sorry one more okay as you can see this is the open heart and here's the defect and the defect is quite far from the tricuspid valve and it has a muscular floor but a fibrous roof and the fibrous roof is continuous with the valves this is juxta arterial this is the rarest subtype of vsd because as you can see there is a continuity between the defect and the uh, uh, semilunar valves and the defect is quite far from the tricuspid valve with the muscular floor okay why do we classify it like this this class this subclassification as a perimembranous muscular and juxta arterial it's not artificial it has its own clinical significance look at this picture this um, this green line it's the conduction system of the heart and look how close the perimembranous vsd is to the conduction system it, the conduction system in fact goes very close to the bottom of the perimembranous VSD but it's quite far from the muscular VSD this is important information for the surgeon because if the surgeon decides to close the VSD if the surgeon faces perimembranous VSD he or she needs to be very careful with the closure because he can very easily damage the conduction system it's the same with juxta arterial uh, VSD because the roof of the juxta arterial VSD is uh, continuous with the pulmonary and aortic valve and if the surgeon uh, won't be, uh, won't be uh, careful enough he or she can very easily uh, uh, create the insufficiency of the valve he can very easily damage the valve so this, uh, this cl subclassification has its own clinical significance okay and uh, uh, the third one is the AVSD, atrioventricular septal defect. This defect uh, is uh, much more complicated for imagination. It's, be it's, it's mainly because the, uh, we, we were used to describe it uh, uh, not exactly according to its own definition. Usually we usually we knew that in this defect there is some sort of communication on the both uh, atrial and ventricular level so there was a defect in the bottom part of the interatrial septum and defect in the upper part of the interventricular septum and because in this uh, in this region there are tricuspid and bicuspid valve there are av valves those valves were also somehow affected and malformed and uh, at the end, this sort of communication created something like channel uh, that, uh, that enabled uh, communication between all four chambers of the heart. That's why it was called AV channel. This is not wrong, but the real definition is slightly different. The real definition is this one common AV junction. It means that instead of separate tricuspid and bicuspid valve we've got one common AV junction, junction one common fibrous annulus with one common five cuspid valve that's the definition of AVSD and the communication between the ventricles or atriums it is usually there it is usually present but it is not the rule it is not necessary so again, the real definition is one common AV junction. There is one common five cuspid AV valve with one fibrox annulus instead of separate tricuspid and bicuspid valve. And the shunt is usually present. It can be on the atrial level. It can be on the ventricular level. It can be both, but it is not necessary. This sort of uh, malformation is typical for patients with Down syndrome. So the patients with Down syndrome usually develop AVSD. 
So as I said, we've got one common AV junction with one 5 cuspid valve. This is the right side of the heart, left side, this is dorsal, and this is ventral part. This is pulmonary trunk and aorta. And uh, this one common valve has two, we call them mural leaflets on the right side, one mural leaflet on the left side, and two leaflets which we call bridging because they bridge the interventricular septum and they are attached to the both left and right ventricle. So again, as I said, the real definition of this defect is one common AV junction and the communication between the, between the chambers is not necessary. Usually there is a communication. So usually there is a communication on the both HLL and ventricular level and it looks like this. So this is the most common example. Sometimes we can have a communication on the ventricular level only, HLL level only, or the, the septa, the interventricular and inter HLL septum can be intact, but we still call it AVSD because there is a one common AV junction. And now look at look at this this subtype. There is a communication on the HRL level only, but the interventricular septum is intact. So uh, earlier for the for the older authors, it looked like ASD. It looked like HRL septal defect, and this was called. Sorry, septum primum ASD. Because the people thought that this is the subtype of ASD. But if it was ASD, there would be a normal tricuspid and bicuspid valve. But instead of that, we've got one common AV junction. That's why this type was excluded from ASD. And nowadays it's considered to be a subtype of AVSD because of the valve one common AV junction. ASD would have normal tricuspid and bicuspid valve, just the communication. You can see it on the picture. Again, this is opened right ventricle. And here, here you can see the defect. This is the communication on the HRL level, ventricular level. And uh, there is a one bridging leaflet and second bridging leaflet. So this, this picture this picture is the AVSD with the communication on the both HRL and ventricular level, so it's this type. But that's not all. If you look carefully at the heart, so uh, this is the right side, left side, so normally, in normal heart, there, there would be tricuspid valve and there would be bicuspid valve. And in normal situation, normally the aorta, which is this, the aorta sits somewhere in between those two valves. So normally in physiological heart, the aorta sits almost in the middle of the heart. But in AVSD, there is one common AV junction, and because of that, the aorta is pushed to the front, is pushed more ventrally. And if you look at the heart from the side, this is the opened left ventricle, this is inlet portion and outlet portion. And in normal situation, the inlet, the length of the inlet and outlet portion, it's almost the same. But in case of AVSD, the outlet portion of the left ventricle is much longer because the aorta is pushed to the front. And this elongation of the outlet portion of the left, left ventricle aggravates the disease. The, it aggravates the hemodynamics of the disease. So it is not, uh, not just about the one single uh, AV junction. And this elongation of the outlet portion of the left ventricle, it has typical appearance at the uh, angiography, for example, or echocardiography. And the heart with, uh, with this disease has typical 
shape of letter S and it looks like gooseneck. So if you will, if you hear a term heart in the shape of gooseneck, it's a typical appearance of AVSD, of patients with AVSD. Okay, so those were the holes in the heart, and now we will switch uh, switch to the um, uh, switch to the uh, cyanotic diseases, and we will talk about the most common cyanotic disease, which is tetralogy of fallout. In these days, you will see those patients almost only uh, at the clinic, at the clinics, at the, cardi uh, the uh, cardiac surgery ward or at the pediatric ward. Basically, especially in the Western world, you won't see those patients at pathology, because the tetralogy of fallout is very well well recognized prenatally, and it's uh, usually it's uh, surgically corrected after the birth with a high percentage of success. But I suppose uh, almost all of you know tetralogy of fallout. There are four things. That's why it is called tetralogy. There is a pulmonary stenosis hypertrophy of the right ventricle, VSD, ventricular septal defect, and overriding aorta. But in fact, all those four things are just the secondary phenomenon. Because in reality, in fact, the tetralogy of fallout is caused by one single congenital malformation and all those other things are just a secondary. And I will explain it now. So now I will go a little bit more to the details, but uh, I think it's quite important because tetralogy of fault is a very common disease and uh, it's good to know uh, what's the real definition of this, of this malformation. So this is normal heart, this is physiological heart. So let's describe the physiological heart at first. This is opened right ventricle, inlet, outlet, this is the tricuspid valve and pulmonary valve. And uh, in the right ventricle, there is one structure, which is called moder moderator band, which is the big trabecule uh, that contains a right bundle of tavar, and it's, uh, it's a characteristic for the right ventricle. It defines the right ventricle. And this moderator band, the whole structure has a shape of letter Y, letter epsilon, uh, because uh, it has two limbs, the upper limb is continuous with the pulmonary valve. <clears throat> the lower limb touches membranous septum. In this region, there is a membranous part of the interventricular septum and the lower limb touches it. And then it continues as a moderator band and it's continuous with the papillary muscle. So that's the typical shape of, the, uh, of, this, of this structure, of this trabecule. And uh, between the limbs of this trabecule, there is something we call outlet septum. It's called outlet septum of the right ventricle, which is in fact, it's in fact not a real septum. It's more like a small fold. It's very thin, very narrow. It's just a fold, but we call it uh, outlet septum. And in a, in a physiological state, it's very small and it sits be be between the limbs of the trabecule. And now look what happened in case of tetralogy of fallout. The septum is big, it's huge. So there is a hypertrophy of the septum. And also the septum was moved to the side. So there is a deviation of the septum uh, to the front and to the, to the top. So there is an anterocephalate deviation of the septum. So two things happened here hypertrophy and deviation of the outlet septum of the right ventricle. And look what it caused. It caused subvalvar stenosis of the, pulmonary, of the pulmonary trunk. So we've got the first thing. The blood, uh, sorry, sorry, the heart needs to pump the blood against the stenosis and it leads to the hypertrophy of the right ventricle. So we've got second thing. The blood needs to find another route, which is VSD, third thing. And this deviation, this movement of the outlet septum pulled the aorta and it pulled the aorta to the right side and the aorta became overriding. So that's the fourth thing. 
So as you can see, all those four things in the trilogy of Fallout are in fact secondary changes to one single congenital malformation, which is uh, which is hypertrophy and deviation of the outlet septum of the right ventricle. So it's good to know and uh, it's good to keep in mind that the tetralogy of Fallout is in fact not the tetralogy, but it's just a single malformation and those four things are secondary. And uh, if you look at the heart with tetralogy in the X-ray, it has a typical shape because normally, normally the heart uh, would have a shape of uh, it would be roughly triangular, let's say. But in case of tetralogy, the apex of the heart is a little bit shifted. Uh, sorry, a little bit lifted. And uh, this shape of the heart with patient in patients with tetralogy. Uh, it reminded a uh, specific structure to the old uh, doctors and it was, uh, it was a club shoe so the wooden wooden shoe so the heart in the shape of the of the wooden shoe of the club shoe it's a typical shape of the heart with the technology of fallout so it's, it's another very old term and then we've got one malformation which is uh, very similar to the tetralogy of Fallout from both morphological and clinical point of the view and it's called double outlet right ventricle. What it means? Double outlet right ventricle means that the both great arteries, aorta and pulmonary trunk originate from the right ventricle. So there is a one big right ventricle, which is huge, dominant, hypertrophic, and the both great arteries originate from it. Uh, if, if, if we want to be real exact, the exact definition is that the more than 50% of the diameter of both arteries needs to originate from the one ventricle. So the, the exact definition is more than 50% of the diameter of the arteries. But uh, roughly speaking, we can say that the, uh, the both aorta and pulmonary trunk originate from the right ventricle. So as you can see, this disease is morphologically very similar to the tetralogy of Fallot, because in the tetralogy of Fallot and also in a double outlet right ventricle, there is a one big hypertrophic right ventricle. A, if the aorta originates from the right ventricle in less than 50%, it is called overriding aorta. And if it exceeds the 50%, it's double outlet ventricle. There is also VSD, almost always. And the VSD can be situated below the aorta, below the pulmonary trunk, somewhere in the middle, or it can be completely non-committed. It can be somewhere else. And the localization of the VSD is quite important from the clinical point of the view because the hemodynamics of the disease will be slightly different according to position of the VSD. And I will try to explain it. So imagine how the blood will flow. Deoxygenated blood will go to the right atrium, right ventricle, and then it will go to the aorta. So it will serve as a, alloy, as a venous alloy that's why this disease is cyanotic and it will also go it will also go the, uh, into the pulmonary trunk and to the lungs and from the lungs it will go to the left atrium left ventricle and then it cannot continue so it will go to the VSD and then the blood have a tendency to continue preferentially to the artery below which the defect is situated. So in this situation, in this situation, the oxygenated blood from the lungs will go to the left ventricle, to the defect, and then predominantly to the aorta, which is basically a good thing. But in this defect, <coughs> the oxygenated blood from the lungs will go to the left ventricle, to the defect, and then predominantly back to the lungs. So this subtype, 
with VSD situated below the pulmonary trunk has a bigger overload of the pulmonary circulation. And that's why this, this subtype was a little bit ex excluded and uh, it's called toxic Bing anomaly. So it's special subtype. Uh, this disease uh, is often associated with other anomalies. There can be AVSD, so, so you can have a double outlet ventricle and also one common junction. Also, you can see, you can find a double outlet ventricle in patients with isomerism. So uh, it's, this disease itself is quite complex, but it's also often associated with another much more complex diseases. Okay, so let's look at some videos. This is explanted heart. So this is heart uh, from the, uh, as explant. That's why it's so huge. So the part of the HRS is missing. And this is the huge dominant ventricle, which is severely hypertrophic because it serves as a double outlet. And there is an artificial valve because the patient probably had a insufficiency of the tricuspid valve. So that's why there is an artificial valve. You see that the tendons are gone. And there is a first great artery and the second one. This one is a aorta because there is a coronary artery near my finger. And this is the pulmonary trunk. And here you can see multiple VSDs, multiple defects. And this is just a tiny left ventricle, which is rudimental and it has no artery going, going outside. Okay, so let's talk about the malformations of the great arteries for a while. And now we have a common arterial trunk. What does it mean? Uh, in a fetal life, when heart develops, there is one stage in which we've got one single artery going from the primitive ventricles. Then there will be a septum that will start to grow into the lumen of the uh, one single artery. And this septum will separate this single artery into the aorta and pulmonary trunk. And because the septum is not straight, but it's uh, twisted, that's why aorta and pulmonary trunk are twisted as well. If this fails, if the septum is not created, we will have a persistent common arterial trunk after the, after the birth, after the delivery. So the common arterial trunk means that we've got one single artery leaving the heart instead of separate um, aorta and pulmonary trunk. So there is one single artery that gives branches uh, to the coronary arteries, pulmonary arteries, and big arteries for the head and neck. Uh, there is one common valve, one common semilunar valve, which is almost always atypical. Uh, it, ha it, can ha it can have a various number of the, various number of the leaflets, of the, of the cusps. There is often a dysplasia of the valve. And this disease is almost always accompanied by VSD. And the common, common artery is almost always overriding. So it sits somewhere in between the left and right ventricle. And now listen carefully. Uh, we used to classify or subclassify this common trunk into four types according to the origin of the pulmonary arteries. If the pulmonary arteries originated from one single artery, it was type A. Type B had two, os two separate osteoms, but uh, very close to each other. And type C had uh, two separate uh, origins of the pulmonary arteries. And type four, it, wa it was a special type in which the pulmonary arteries originated from descending aorta. So it orig they, they originated more distally. But now, nowadays, we know that this fourth type of the common arterial trunk is not 
a common trunk in, at, at all. Nowadays we know that this big artery it's aorta. So it's normal aorta. So this subtype is in fact a genesis of the pulmonary trunk. So this is in fact a genesis of the pulmonary trunk, not the common artery. And this one big artery is just the aorta. And those so-called pulmonary arteries are not pulmonary arteries, but those are dilated systemic collaterals that allows the return of the blood to the lungs. So that's why this fourth type was excluded because we know that this is not a common trunk. This was excluded and now nowadays we call it solitary trunk, not the common trunk. Because we know that this is just the agenesis of the pulmonary trunk and this one single artery is aorta. So there was a change in the classification. Again, let's look at some videos. Uh, sorry, again. Okay. So this is the heart with the common trunk. You see that the heart is uh, has an atypical shape. It's quite globoid. Right and left uh, appendages, which are quite close to each other. We call it a juxtaposition of the appendages. This is the right appendage and the left appendage. But they've got quite typical morphology, so there's nothing wrong with them. And there is a one big artery in between instead of aorta and pulmonary trunk. So there is one huge artery, one common artery. So this is the right atrium. There is a defect. This is coronary sinus, which looks normal. And this is the right ventricle. And you see it's quite dilated. It's dilated, but the tricuspid valve looks okay. And there is a communication, there is a VSD. And this is the left, left ventricle. Uh, here you can see a bicuspid valve, which looks normal, it looks fine. But look how huge the left ventricle is, there is a dilatation and there is a massive hypertrophy of the left ventricle. And there is a one single artery going or originating, originating from the ventricles instead of separate aorta and pulmonary trunk. There is atypical valve, which is dysplastic. And this one huge artery give origin to the big, big branches for head and neck and pulmonary arteries as well. This is the left pulmonary artery. And there should be also the right one. Okay, so this was the common chunk, and now the transposition of the great arteries. So let's get back to the uh, to the fetal life. So again, there is a one common artery going from the primitive ventricles, and there is the septum that grows into the lumen and separates the common chunk uh, into the aorta and pulmonary chunk. And as I said, uh, this septum is twisted. Uh, the transposition of the great arteries happens in case or in situation in which the septum is normally created, but it is not twisted. The septum is straight. And in this situation, we've got transposition of the great artery, which, which means that the aorta originates from right ventricle and pulmonary trunk originates from left ventricle. And as I mentioned at the beginning, imagine, imagine the flow of the blood deoxygenated the venous blood goes to the right ven right atrium right ventricle and to the aorta and back to the systemic circulation oxygenated blood from the lungs goes to the left atrium left ventricle to the pulmonary trunk and back to the lungs so in this situation in this condition we've got two separate circuits which cannot mix and therefore 
This malformation, in its original form, is lethal. You cannot survive it. The only chance how to survive it is the communication. So there needs to be some sort of communication uh, between the left and the right part of the heart that allows the shunting of the blood, which is usually VSD. And VSD is present in the vast majority of the cases. So as you can see, in this case, the VSD is uh, actually a life-saving condition. In some situations, the, com the shunting, is, the communication is missing and it needs to be created artificially by catheterization and because otherwise the disease would be lethal. So this is the transposition of the great arteries. The problem is that uh, there is a lot of additional minor malformations that accompany this disease and aggravate the, aggravate the clinical course. Very typical are the obstructive lesions such as uh, fibrous rings or muscular ridges in the, especially in the outflow tract of the uh, outflow part of the left ventricle. So they are quite common. So you can see various fibrous rings and muscular ridges or anomalous attachments of the, of the tendons of the um, bicuspid valve and many other, th other things. So usually there are some additional malformations that can aggravate the disease. What is really important is, is the information that the uh, transposition of the great arteries is often accompanied by anomalous cores of the coronary arteries. So look closely. Uh, in a no normal situation, in a physiological state, <coughs> aorta and pulmonary trunk, the valve, aortic valve and pulmonary valve have uh, three cusps. Aorta has left, right and dorsal posterior cusp. Pulmonary valve has left, right and anterior cusp. But look at the transposition. Th these are the arteries in transposition. This is the aorta because they are coronary arteries and the aorta has right, left, and anterior cusp. So, in case of transposition, the aorta and pulmonary trunk are not only switched, but they are also rotated in 180 degrees. And this is often accompanied by anomalous cores of the coronary arteries. So they can be, uh, one, one, of the, one of the branches can go uh, behind the pulmonary trunk. This is intramural course of the coronary arteries, which means that the part of the coronary artery go in the wall or through the wall of the aorta. And you should keep, keep this in mind because if the surgeon does so-called uh, so arterial switch, it means that uh, he or she uh, cuts the piece of the aorta, cuts the piece of the pulmonary trunk, uh, he will switch them and uh, the disease is cured. But the surgeon needs to be aware of the possibility of anomalous cores of the coronary arteries. Otherwise, he or she could very easily damage them. So this is good to know. So there is a, not only there is not only a transposition of the great arteries, but the both great arteries are 180 degrees rotated. And there is a very, uh, very commonly there is a anomalous cores of the coronary arteries. So keep this in mind, please. And congenitally corrected transposition looks like this. Uh, the heart in the congenitally corrected transposition is like that. There is a right atrium, which continues to the left ventricle and left ventricle continues to pulmonary trunk. Left atrium continues to right ventricle and right ventricle continues to aorta. So it's, it's in fact, it's an inversion of the ventricles. And you would, you would say, you, would, you, you can wonder. Okay, so the flow of the blood is normal. The, blood, the heart is corrected. That's why we call it cor congenitally corrected transposition, because the heart, let's say, corrected itself. 
So it's just the inversion of the ventricles and, uh, and the switched ventricles can adapt uh, to different pressures, that's no problem. So the flow of the blood stays normal. So the hemodynamics of the blood, of, of the heart, uh, can be normal. That's why we call it congenitally corrected. But the problem is that this, this malformation uh, is almost always or very commonly accompanied by secondary malformations that, let's say, discorrect the correction. Very typically, there is a malformation of the tricuspid valve, which is very similar to Epstein malformation. There are some minor differences, and we call it Epsteinoid malformation. Very commonly, there is a VSD. All pulmonary stenosis. Stenosis of the of the uh, the pulmonary stenosis is quite common in this malformation. So as you can see, sadly there is a uh, very commonly there are some additional malformations that discorrect the correction of the disease. And what is also important is the fact that uh, heart may be corrected morphologically, but it is not corrected with regards to the conduction system. And this is important information, not only for the transposition, but this is important, this is good to know uh, generally for, all, for any heart malformation, because uh, many heart malformations may look simple from the morphological point of the view, but they can be quite heavy or quite severe from the, with regards to the conduction system. And it happens in congenitally corrected malformation as well because the heart can look quite okay from the morphological point of the view, but the conduction system is completely malformed because the inversion of the, of the chambers. So the, the AV node, the AV node is misplaced. And quite often it's divided into two. Quite, quite often there is dorsal and ventral AV node. And the bundle of his is very very long because it needs to bypass the left ventricle situated on the right side and after that it branches to the bun to the branches of the var so as you can see the heart may look quite okay but the conduction system is completely malformed and misplaced so those patients can suffer severe uh, arrhythmias And it's good to keep in mind generally that each heart malformation uh, can be accompanied by a lot of conduction problems. Okay, and last but not least, we've got coarctation of the aorta. And what does it mean? Coarctation is narrowing of the aorta. And it's almost always situated in the proximity of uh, arterial duct, of ductus arteriosus. Uh, just with regards to the terms, there is a difference between correctation, atresia, and, and interruption. Correctation is narrowing. Atresia means complete occlusion of the arterial lumen. So in, in atresia, uh, there is just a fibro thin fibrous band instead of normal aorta. And interruption means that a part of the aorta is missing. Usually, the interruption is situated in aortic isthmus, which is the segment between left common carotid and left subclavian uh, arteria. But the correctation is narrowing. Usually it looks like this. So usually there is a waste that creates the correctation. Sometimes you can have a hypoplasia of the whole aortic arch or of a big part of the aortic arch. We call it tubular hypoplasia. And very rarely the aorta looks normal from the external point of the view, but there is an intraluminal membrane that occludes the lumen of the aorta from inside. So that's how coarctation look like, looks like. And from the etiological point of the view and also from the prognostic part, point of the view, it's quite important to differentiate the coarctation without arterial duct and with patent arterial duct because those are two separate diseases uh, if you have a coarctation without arterial duct it's uh, it's usually a result of the fibrous retraction of the duct 
So as the arterial duct closes and retracts, it pulls the aorta and creates waste. So this disease is usually an isolated defect and you can often find it or, or it can often manifest in older patients. <coughs> but the coarctation with patent arterial duct is much more complex malformation. And the, and the etiology is like this. So the connection between arterial duct and aorta normally in a physiological state looks like this. So it looks like arrow. So if I used uh, uh, if I used um, surgical terminology, I would say it's it looks like end to, uh, side to side anastomosis. But in case of coarctation, the connection between aorta and arterial duct is more perpendicular. So again, if I used uh, surgical terminology, it would be end to side anastomosis. And this atypical ducto aortic connection creates the coarctation. So this is in fact much more complex situation. It usually manifests in small children. In the vast majority of the cases, the coarctation is predactal, very rarely postdactal. And what is important, it often comes as a part of more complex malformations, especially hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which means that the whole left part of the heart is hypoplastic and the coarctation is just a part of the hypoplasia. That's why the prognosis of those patients is uh, more severe, it's, po it's more poor. And this sort of coarctation is often of a tubular type, so there is often a hypoplasia of the whole aortic arch, not just the waist. So as you can see, the coarctation with and without arterial duct, uh, those are two separate uh, diseases. And the coarctation with patent arterial duct is a much more complex malformation and the prognosis is uh, worse in those patients. So again, let's look at some videos. So this is heart with coarctation. This is the aorta, aortic arch, big, big branches. And as you can see, in the close proximity of the arterial duct, there is a narrow wing. So this is the preductal coarctation. You see that this part is much, much more narrow compared to the ascending aorta. And as I said, interruption is, uh, is it means that the part of the aorta is missing. So usually it's in the part is in in the isthmus of the aorta. So we've got ascending aorta. This is descending aorta, and this part is missing. This is pulmonary trunk with the pulmonary arteries, and this part it's arterial duct. So this disease is it's quite easy to misdiagnose it as a transposition of the great arteries because you can very easily say okay so we've got some artery going from the left heart and then we've got second artery which looks like aorta and it originates from the right ventricle so this must be transposition but this is definitely not the aorta the aorta starts here and continues here and this part is pulmonary trunk and this part is arterial duct, it's ductus arteriosus. And in this region, the aorta is missing. So um, when you assess the heart with uh, interruption, it's quite easy to misdiagnose it as a transposition. Again, some pictures. So here's the ascending aorta. This is pulmonary trunk, which is quite dilated. big branches for head and neck. And in this region, the aorta is missing. So in this part, there is an interruption. And this is descending aorta. This is pulmonary trunk. And this part, this is arterial duct. And this is descending aorta. And in this region, there is interruption. Ascending aorta, 
and that's basically all okay and just as just the very brief, very briefly there are some other malformations of the aortic arch you can have a vascular vascular ring which is usually double aortic arch it's usually a double aortic arch that encircles trachea and or esophagus and compress them so those patients can manifest uh, with uh, dyspnea or stridor or dysphagia and the vascular sling it's something different it's usually aberrant origin of the left pulmonary artery from the right pulmonary artery and this left artery goes back to the left and runs between aorta and esophagus and again can compress them and also pulmonary veins can be malformed and you should know anomalous pulmonary venous return what does it mean uh, pulmonary veins opens into left atrium if they open uh, somewhere else we call it anomalous venous return so pulmonary veins do not connect to morphologically left atrium uh, it can be partial which means that just the sum of the just the sum of the pulmonary veins open somewhere else not all of them and total which means that all four pulmonary veins opens somewhere else the anomalous return can be supracardial which is somewhere above the heart usually it's superior cable vein cardial which means to the right atrium not left but the right one usually it's coronary sinus and infracardial meaning somewhere below the heart usually it's a portal vein this this subtype is the most dangerous because the deoxygenated blood needs to needs to go through the liver so again it looks like that in a lot of the cases maybe in the majority of the cases the pulmonary veins uh, connect into one single vein and that single vein goes anomalous goes in anomalous way so usually those veins connect into one single vein behind the heart and then the single vein go somewhere goes somewhere else but they can open separately okay and this is the last last malformation or not my malformation this is the group of the malformation it's quite uh, it may be uh, quite difficult for imagination for understanding and i know that this lecture is quite long but uh, still i would like to mention it at the end because this is quite important uh, group of the malformations and it's not so rare you will you will you will see it definitely it's called functionally univentricular circulation what does it mean the word functionally is essential here because the heart with one ventricle it exists but it's very very rare it's very rare usually the heart has two ventricles so it has four chambers but one ventricle is somehow excluded from the function that's why we call it functionally univentricular circulation so the heart is functionally univentricular but morphological morphology is vari variable usually there are two ventricles and truly univentricular heart is rare uh, we will talk about the double inlet ventricle not outlet but inlet and we will talk about the atresias of the valves atresia of the tricuspid and bicuspid valve and atresia of the pulmonary uh, trunk and aorta and we will talk about the hypoplastic left and heart syndrome and that will be all so double inlet ventricle what does it mean if you say double inlet ventricle it means that the both atriums open into one single ventricle so double outlet ventricle means that the both great arteries originate from one ventricle and double inlet ventricle means that the both atriums open into one ventricle usually it's the left ventricle <coughs> so uh, outlet ventricle is usually right inlet ventricle is usually left but it can be right and sometimes as i said very rarely there is one single indeterminate ventricle but in the most of the cases double inlet ventricle is the left left one uh, the 
opening of the HLMOS can be separate or that there can be a VSD, it doesn't matter. And it says nothing about the rest of the heart. So it says nothing about the great arteries or, pul or pulmonary veins. And as you can see in this situation, the one ventricle serves for both circuits and the second ventricle is very small and rudimental. So that's why double inner ventricle belongs to the family of univentricular circulation. Atresia of the tricuspid and bicuspid valve also behaves like univentricular circulation because if you have atresia of the tricuspid valve, for example, it excludes the right ventricle from the function. So again, <coughs> the atresia of the tricuspid or bicuspid valve behaves like a univentricular circulation. Uh, again, it says nothing about the rest of the heart. Uh, there is a difference between atresia and in perforation and stenosis. Stenosis of the valve means that the lumen, that the osteum of the valve is present, but it's very small because it's stenotic. In perforation means that the valve is present, but there is no osteum, no lumen. The valve is imperforated. Atresia means that the whole AV junction is missing, that there is no fibrous annulus. So we can very easily lift the atrium from the ventricle. This has uh, this has imp it has important meaning for the surgeons. So the atresia of the AV valves behaves like a univentricular circulation, and it's the same for aorta and pulmonary trunk. Aortic and pulmonary atresia also behaves like univentricular univentricular circulation but only with intact ventricular septum. If the patient has a VSD, the VSD enables shunting of the blood. But if you have atresia of the aorta or pulmonary trunk and the interventricular septum is intact, this heart will again behave like univentricular because one part of the heart is excluded from the function. But it's, it's uh, important to keep in mind that uh, very often, maybe in the majority of the cases, those atresias of the valves are not isolated, but they are just a part of the hypoplasia of the whole left or right half of the heart. So that's why they very often come as a part of <coughs> so-called hypoplastic left or right heart syndrome meaning that the whole left or right half of the heart is hypoplastic and doesn't work. So the second half of the heart needs to supply both circuits. <coughs> hypoplastic left heart syndrome is much more common. And there is, as I said, there is a complete hypoplasia of the whole left part of the heart. So the left atrium is smaller, the bicuspid valve is atritic, or at least there is a severe stenosis. Usually there is a severe hypoplasia of the left ventricle, usually with a fibroelastosis of the endocardium. There is often aortic stenosis or atresia, and there is often correctation. Remember, as I said, the correctation of the tubular type with arterial duct, it often comes as a part of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So you can see it here. Hypoplastic right heart syndrome is not so common, uh, but the morphology is the same, but just for the right ventricle. And a few pictures and videos uh, for the end. So this is the hypoplastic, I think it would be left heart syndrome because this is the right ventricle, which looks quite okay. The heart is very small, but the I think it was uh, it was uh, young fetus, but uh, the heart is small. As you can see, there is a ASD, and this is the right ventricle, which is quite okay. The tricuspid valve looks normal. Uh, 
and this is the outlet portion and there is a pulmonary valve which looks okay as well and this is the left ventricle which is smaller it is not so severe usually usually the hypoplasia of the left ventricle is even even uh, even more severe but still it's hypoplastic and here you can see uh, the bicuspid valve all the leaflets attach into single uh, single papillary muscle which we call parachute bicuspid valve so there is a uh, another anomaly which we call parachute valve <coughs> And here you can see the outlet and aorta. And as you can see, there should be coarctation. And yes, here it is. There is a coarctation because this part of the aortic arch is much, much thinner than the ascending aorta. So this is how the hypoplastic left heart syndrome looks like. Okay, and again, this is the pic uh, this is another picture of the hypoplastic left heart syndrome. You see how how small and hypoplastic the left uh, ventricle is. And th th this was this was after the surgical correction because there is a shunt there is a shunt between the dominant right ventricle and pulmonary arteries, which is this. And here you can see the aneurysm. There is the aneurysm of the in the shunt, which was the cause of the death. And the last video is uh, hypoplastic right heart syndrome, and you can see it at the first glance. This is the superior cable vein. There is some aberrant branch that connects the superior cable vein with the lungs, but it doesn't matter. This is the right appendage. There is a defect. It is not well visible, but the, the, there are fenestrations in the in the valve. So there was ASD, and here you can see the severe hypoplasia of the right ventricle. Look how small the ventricle is, and the tricuspid valve is severely stenotic and fibrotic. And this is the pulmonary valve. It looks imperforated. It looks like imperforation, but there should be a small, small osteum, small lumen, as you can see it uh, here. Okay, so this is just a severe stenosis. And here's the pulmonary trunk, which is dilated. There is a post stenotic dilatation. Okay, and this is the left appendage and left ventricle, which is dominant and severely hypertrophic. And this is the outlet portion. There is a bicuspid valve. And here we can see the aorta and quite normal looking aortic valve. And as you can see, the aorta looks quite okay. Okay, so this was hypoplastic right heart syndrome. And this is just the view from the back, and you can see that there are pulmonary veins that open into the left atrium. So there, so there is no anomalous return. So okay, guys, that's all. I know it was it was quite a lot of information because I understand that it's very easily it's very easy to flood you with the information about congenital heart diseases because this topic is very difficult. But uh, I definitely didn't I definitely didn't describe all the malformations because it would require two days, not just one hour. But I hope it was uh, helpful for you and um, see you see you soon.